she starts the she's got lit, lower limb onset. She's uh, stumbling a little bit and she's in a pain, but she's still pretty functional. You see the one pretty well her. She's got a nice smile on her face. In 2010, this is unusual for somebody with limb onset. Seven years later, but she's still living probably. But she's also the walk this year to ALS. She's now confined to a wheelchair. Her speech is very um, uh, affected. She's very difficult to understand. You can notice her face, how thin her face is, and how it's very slack jaw. And uh, she no longer can function or do much of any shape on his own. So this is limb onset. So this next case, this is a lady with the baseball hat on the right. This is Debbie. Debbie has vulgar onset ALS. She's got some story in the speech that says that that's her first symptom that she uh, notices. In 2007, she's back to walk and she's ALS in Dayton, Ohio. And she's looking pretty robust. She's, you know, looking healthy. She's got a lot of muscle mass and um, she's smiling. 2009, two years later, she's confined to a wheelchair. She's speaking with, she does have a lack of communication device. She can no longer talk at all when she has to use a device to, to uh, communicate. So, um, ALS management, what can we do for our patients? And at this point, not just a whole lot. We can try to slow the disease down. The only FDA approved drug is Lodipec. It was um, first approved back in. I believe. I started working with this chapter in 1999, and everybody was so positive and so excited about this one drug we had, and that's still all we have. Um, nutritional support and respiratory support, <coughs> most of the research shows that by paying more attention to these two areas, we can do a lot to help our patient be more functional and maybe live a little longer. And then we manage their symptoms. That's what we can do is try to make them comfortable and help them manage and uh, get along with what has happened to them physically and emotionally. <clears throat> so when we talk to our patients about ALS, we have to talk to them about how do they want to manage their symptoms. Do they want to go the palliative route or do they want the life-sustaining, uh, aggressive type of measure? We find that the younger the patient is, the more they want the life-sustaining. The patients who are maybe 50s, 60s, 70s, they really just want to live the rest of their life. They want to enjoy life and, you know, just kind of chill out for the most part. But uh, we do see a lot of our young patients who do choose to have ventilators and people choose to chill out. So we'll go over a couple of case studies. The first one is a limb onset patient. This is a 76-year-old male. He's right-handed. He lives with his wife. They're in a two-story home with a walk-in show on the second floor. Uh, there's a half bath on the first floor. He is retired. He likes to fish, to read, to be very active in the church. In June of 2012, he begins to notice that he's got some leg weakness. He's got some foot drop. The foot is kind of not when he walks and he's riding on his toes. He's got the right, right arm weakness, but he thinks that this is just due to some injuries that he's had in the past, but he's not really paying too much attention to that at this time. His symptoms progress in July of 2013. He is uh, worked up by a neurologist. They do an MRI. <clears throat> they do some EMGs and confirm that he does have ALS. And I just refer you to an ALS clinic for follow-up. A month later, in August of that year, he's uh, his baseline, he's 217 pounds. His full power capacity, which is what we one of the measures we use to test the respiratory rank, is to, uh, 81%. Um, normally, so he's dropped a little bit, but 81%, he's not had, he don't, the patient doesn't have much in the way of symptoms at that level. They're pretty functional. He's using uh, a CPAP, which is the machine that people used to have sleep apnea, and he has, uh, he does have sleep apnea. So this is why he's using this, not because of his ALS, but because of another underlying uh, diagnosis. His motor exam, he's got some atrophy of his right bicep, his tricep, and his hand. And, but he's got no speech involvement, no swallowing problems, and no real respiratory symptoms. Physical therapy sees him, and they recommend bacitinib because he's got very spastic limbs. And uh, they talk about stretching. He was put on bacitin to kind of help with the spasticity. And the therapist talks with him a little bit about what the uh, side effects might be of bacitin and how, you know, how to use it, what the therapy would be. They 
you talk energy conservation, a big thing with this PCPC. They really, and it's really neat with our patients. They get very easily fatigued, so they do have to watch what they do and be careful about their activities so they save the thread. Some equipment is recommended for them. <clears throat> a wheel walker, uh, a transport of wheelchair, which is a very lightweight wheelchair, so you're not really dealing with those two kinds of, the standard wheelchair has big wheels on the side that takes it to propel themselves. The transporter is a much smaller wheelchair, it's very lightweight, it weighs less than 20 pounds, and it's uh, somebody has to push it with several wheels so you can propel yourself. So we uh, give them a chair, we give them a seat assist, which is a little spring load device, the patient sits on it in a chair, it's like a big cushion, but then when they go to get up, it kind of strains a little bit and then helps them stand up. Uh, we also give them a gate belt and a bed team. A bed team is a uh, device that you slip under the mattress in your bed, but it's like a, uh, a rail so that you can help pull yourself out of bed. And we uh, is recommended to have occupational therapy for transfer training. Uh, to look at some of the other equipment that you might need. And start to talk to some of them about home occupation. Who's got a second floor bedroom, a second floor bathroom, and we know that if Dale is progressing, that he's not going to be able to get up those stairs. Um, we talked about a ramp, how it's going to get in and out of the house, stair steps. And then he referred, referred to a wheelchair, the feeding place, so that we can start to talk about a power wheelchair. At some point, it opens into your hand as independent as possible. He's going to need a power wheelchair. He's not going to be able to move himself in a wheelchair, or maybe he doesn't want his caregiver to do that for him. Occupational therapy focuses on his right upper extremity movement, and that he can't really, he's certainly not be able to do things for himself. He cannot be able to shave or comb his hair. Um, they recommend a transfer bench and shower chair so he can sit down in the shower to conserve his strength. Uh, they talk about occupational therapy out, or on an outpatient basis to go into more detail about how to help him function in his living environment. Uh, they talk about a bed team again, a leg lifter, which is a device you kind of hook around your foot and you can help pull your foot up to put you in the bed. Um, the easy lift is the same thing as a seat assist as a physical therapist recommends. It's a sock aid that you put your sock on and just helps put a little pull on your leg. They're so aware they have a little built-up handle on it so that as his grip deteriorates and he can't grasp something, he can hold it with a bigger diameter of uh, a little cushion there to help, help him keep, continue to feed himself. And also a butt hook, a little thing, a little device that helps you button your shirt. Uh, the patient's already stopped driving. If he had not on, on his own, he felt that he was no longer safe to drive, so he stopped. But if he had not, at this point, they would order us a driving evaluation to assure that he, the person is safe to drive. And what do we do in this case? Our involvement, first of all, we want to get them as much information as possible about the ALS bulletin to help understand what the progression of the disease and what they can expect down the road. We also talk to them about the available of other resources because as they become more disabled, they're going to need more help. Uh, are they a veteran? Do they belong to a church community? Um, what are the transportation <coughs> options? You can't take a, a wheelchair in a regular car. You've got to somehow make some other arrangements now. Uh, is there extended family who can help them out? We provide educational information. Uh, we have a patient resource guide. We have some booklets from the ALS Association. And we also familiarize the patient and caregiver with ALS management issues, especially that nutrition and that respiratory care again. And we also introduced the National ALS Registry, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I think there's a handout on the back table if you didn't pick one up already. And then we also try to support the, the patient and the family, but if he, in this case, we wanted to make sure he knew about clinical trials or research options if he wants to go that way. Not everybody does, but it certainly is important for us to learn more about ALS, so we encourage the patient to be involved. We also introduce chapter services, uh, which includes support groups, community letter, access to care services. If you decide that you call us in the office, we have you know, the care services staff, which is there to help the patient and to figure things out. Maybe they didn't understand in the doctor's office to make sure they get referrals that they need and so on. And uh, also to talk about our equipment loan program in case we need help with that. The second case is a vulva onset case. Uh, speech by birth, but in this case, not only does the patient have speech problems, but she has what they call FTE, frontotemporal uh, dementia. This is a 
49-year-old right-handed woman who is a smoker. She's got some other uh, medical history. She's got a, her social history, the, her spouse is very, very supportive. She has a son who lives nearby. And the son, and as the patient has, is, becomes more debilitated and she needs more assistance, the, they split, the father and the son work at the same place and they split the shift. She takes one shift, the son takes the other, so somebody's always with the patient. Uh, so they, um, anyway, they live in a one story home, so that's a plus on her part. We're not talking about trying to take them out and pay to the home. Uh, she does have a walk in shower, and but they have a kid in high school, which can be difficult for somebody who has some disabilities. So uh, it's something that she has to maybe work around. She, became, she first notices some difficulties in April 2012 when she starts noticing some changes in her speech. And she tells the doctor that my speech sounds like I'm drunk. In September of that year, she's diagnosed with what's called an onset ALS, and her EMG shows that she's got an extensive denervation of the left upper extremity and sparse denervation of the left or the lower extremity. So her gait at this point, she can still get around, she's still walking, she's very functional. So March of 2013, she's got swallowing problems. She's got very, her speech impairment has progressed. She's very dysarthric at this point. She's got fasciculations of her extremities. She's got bilateral upper arm or upper extremity weakness. She's got some shortness of breath, which is most noticeable because when she tries to lay flat in bed, it makes her very short of breath. She doesn't, uh, she needs to be propped up in bed to, to catch her breath. Uh, her gait and her lower extremity um, weakness are pretty, are pretty normal. I forgot one there. Excessive crying. This is uh, not STD, but the excessive crying uh, happens a lot in low office patients, but we do see it an awful lot in AO with ALS. And the differential diagnosis here is she doesn't have depression, but she cries because she's upset and tearful and, um, you know, thinking about the course of her disease, or is there pseudoval with affect? The pseudoval with those, I mean, they're both treatable, it's just a matter of deciding which one it is. Her weight at this point is 119 pounds, and her force vital capacity is 40%, same as the other patient, 81%. She's 40% in vulva patients, vulva onset patients, get into respiratory problems a lot sooner than what the limb onset. And respiratory involvement is is what is the, is the cause of the demise of these patients. Um, at this point, we're really addressing her communication options. What can we do to help her communicate? Because of right now, she's got really pretty much, you know, she's got very advanced speech impairment. And the other thing we talk about is a feeding tube, the PEG. Um, well, for onset patients, just like the uh, respiratory uh, impairments that they get, they also get swallowing issues much sooner, they're choking, they're having trouble taking medication, and a feeding tube is a, is a frequent option. In June of 2013, she's now down to 112 pounds. She's got very profound speech impairment now. The feeding tube has been replaced not because she wanted one, but because she has to get hot to bring pneumonia and they decided to go to the one who's there. And this is with characteristic of this patient. It is very hard for the husband to take charge. The, she was kind of very tearful and non-functional, and the husband didn't want to upset her, so they were very delayed in making decisions and taking charge. Um, she's got some or a facial weakness, and she has um, her poor cell capacity is pretty much due to her respiratory evaluation at this time because, number one, she's got a little bit of um, dementia. She can't understand how to do the test, and she can't get her lips to be able to around the little uh, mouthpiece that she used to do the respiratory test. In September 2013, she weighed 109 pounds, so she's dropping quickly in spite of the fact that she has a feeding tube. She is oriented, she knows where she is and who people are, but she's got some delayed recall. She's been able to do general stuff, but she can't do like an old thing. Her speech at this point is unintelligible. You can't understand her. She's using a dry erase board and just hand signals to, to uh, tell people what she likes. She's 
that Tommy asked after he had, he had some stipulations at the time. She's also showing signs of uh, depressive central dementia, including a decline in social memory and uh, her orientation and communication is on slides. But I noticed she's got poor insight, and that's very characteristic of SPD. It's this uh, they develop an impulsiveness, they, they can't think through judgments, and that's a, a hallmark sign of SPD. Because she can't think, she's not able to do the respiratory, uh, the abnormal screening with the rest, for respiratory issues, they decide to do an overnight pulse ox. And uh, by doing that, they can show that she really does have some impairments. And she's got the six digits that she's saturated. She cannot, um, she's not breathing well during the night. And uh, they start her on Vicodin. She is using a suction device. The, the heart doesn't show all the oxygen. She also has a coughing fit that has to help uh, make secretions leak to the chest. But in spite of all this, she's still getting her endogenous. Now she's starting to have some impairment of her limbs as well. She's ambulating a little more slow while they're still independent. And she requires a lot of care for dressing and makeup. Her husband doesn't make up, he does hair, he does everything for her at this point. In this case, we are more focused on the caregiver as compared to the patient. The caregiver version of ALS is extreme. It's a huge burden. So we're looking at how is he handling, how is the caregiver handling the care for the patient. Um, we're uh, trying to talk about advanced disease management, maybe some hospice. And like I said before, they really, they were very hesitant to put these, they didn't want to look down the road at all. This is a, a difficult family to deal with. They do not have advanced directives. And when I said to them, the husband, I said, you have, uh, if you want to put them on hospice, how about some advanced directives? We need to talk about these things. He wanted me to bring the information in a brown paper or an envelope to the clinic and hand it to him outside the room to his wife because he didn't want her to know that he was talking about these things. He was afraid he would upset her. We also start to discuss with the, with, in this case, we discussed the reasons for uh, the implication of weight loss. We're you know, giving her information. We're trying to get the information about community before they need it. In this case, they waited until it was um, kind of forced upon them rather than and uh, we're also looking for opportunities to get the caregiver a little bit of a rest, whether it's uh, um, a home health thing that comes in, um, and the family might need to come in and give them a break. We do promote the poultry participation. We give her what we call a communication board. We do a laminated board, has pictures on the front so that they can point to things that they want. Um, a little alphabet to um, actually to spell things out for themselves and their food reference for you know when you like to turn it on you can say I'm giving you a break and so on and in this case we're also really stressing on change of name and how she changes her home and what she loves make sure you know um, she has somebody with her all the time to help her get around so our patients have uh, some important decisions to make uh, we want to know how to tell the family when do they stop working when do they practice when and whether they actually have to change their living arrangements and where they are living now and that will just uh, keep them down the road. Um, how are they going to handle the daily needs, the, the bathing and the, the hair combing and the shaving and so on? Uh, how are they going to deal with the ability to well, uh, driving? Um, when can they stop driving? Are they going to get an hour wheelchair? Are they going to pick up the annual wheelchair? Is the home big enough to handle uh, whatever type of wheelchair they decide to choose. Um, are they going to get a feed or two? Um, is there a, which is the best communica communication device for them? Uh, and then how are they going to deal with the respiratory involvement associated with ALS? Are they going to use non-invasive measures, which include the BiPAP? So we see a new uh, type of respiratory device that is, uh, it does all the things that BiPAP does, but uh, it has some advanced features. But it still is a non-invasive of uh, ventilation. They can also uh, have a break and get on a ventilator. And we, now we also offer them a diagnosis so they can get the uh, benefit of this. So now I'd like to meet some of our actual patients. And you can kind of see, uh, and I, I, the thing I'd like to focus on as we kind of go through the slides is how these individual, individual patients have are living the rest of their life, what they have left, and uh, 
and uh, some of the potent skills are. This is Mary Cat, the patient who was going to at ALS Clinic. She was an RN. She was 60 years old when she passed away. Crohn's disease started with pain and weakness. And uh, this was diagnosed in 2011. And the interesting of her is that she did have diet medication. And she was doing quite well with it. And um, she got a musical club. And her husband could not give her cups in time for it. And the squad did not give her the time. But you see that, you know, when she was uh, still pretty much disabled, she was still having a good time. She really wanted to do the things that she enjoyed doing and the family was doing. So um, she was a real off all the time by email, even though she was losing her speech, it was, uh, uh, she was a really neat lady. This is one of our longer living patients that is still living. She's 48 years old, or was 48 years old when she was diagnosed in 1995. She's 63 now, and she has no onset. She is uh, dependent upon a vent. She works in a nursing home facility. Those are her two children. Um, the daughter, Brian spends a lot of time on the internet. He corresponds with other patients. Um, he likes to send me emails about what he's done for knee treatments and get my opinion. So he's he's still very his mind is very active and he uh, he communicates by use of the device. You can see that black thing in front of me. That's his uh, communication device. And this is Roger. Roger's 70 years old. He was diagnosed in 2002. So he's also one of our longer living patients. Um, he has lower extremity weakness, and he's just quite a character, as you can see. Roger seems to be acting like a challenge. He's a crazy cat. He's at a Christmas party. And Roger spends time, he likes to go around to different schools and high schools and local colleges. He lives in the Dayton area. He, he has a lot of impaired speech. He has a limb impairment. But he saves his little talk on what his speech device, and then he goes to these other speakers and they'll talk. So he's he really enjoys kind of sharing with us what his life is like and you know, what ALS is all about. And this is Lori. Lori was a plus 39 when she was diagnosed back in 2004, and Lori is still living. In 2005, we go to Brandon Free Chief and she has her two boys with her. Her sons were with a grade school, both in grade school, one in junior high and one in grade school at that time. And uh, in 2014, just this past uh, fall, uh, this is Lori with the two boys. They've graduated from college now. Lori has limb onset, particularly upper, uh, her arm. You see in the picture in 2014, look how thin her arm is. So she's, you know, she's progressing now, but she's really uh, done extremely well and for a long period of time. But you see her sons have kids who are cured. This is their website. They um, do a lot of ALS awareness. Uh, Lori is also very involved with them in trying to help uh, you know, spread the word. So they're just, uh, they're just a very active family. And this is Ray. <clears throat> he lives in the mirror by the stars. He is still living. He was diagnosed at age 43, hand weakness. And I saw Ray about maybe <coughs> a year or so before this picture was taken. I had known him for a while, and he looked so thin, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is not looking good. Then he and his, his wife, his in-laws got to involved in a product called Mona Bean. It's kind of a, a drink. I think it's high calorie, but um, they started drinking this regularly, Greg gained weight. And the next thing I know, his wife sent me a picture of Greg riding his motorcycle. It was like a miracle cure. And I think it mostly, mostly because his nutrition improved, and he really kind of went back to the other way and had a lot of improvement as opposed to going downhill more. And he's still looking and still, you know, he's, he's progressing, but he's still alive. And this is Bill. Bill's a minister. He's 66 years old. And you see another picture from just another slide or two of uh, a couple years back. He looks much more healthy and well then. Bill keeps a blog. Uh, he's a real inspiration to other patients. He's uh, up until one week. He's been attending his courses regularly. And uh, the other patients really look, look to him for uh, support and inspiration. So the goal of working with ALS, we want
want to our staff will want to work with the treatment team which is everything we be it is a neurologist or you know in clinic we want to be involved in the disease management the decision making that the families go through we want to help support the family and the caregiver and we want to help coordinate care and coordinate care is so very important with these patients and i can't end our talk without talking about the other people i work with we have one of the greatest care services staff you ever saw uh, the first picture is myself with my co-worker Lee here here in Columbus. In the middle is Yvonne Dressman, also known as Katie. She works out of uh, her home in the Cincinnati area, and Wilma, which has our home in the Springfield and Dayton area. We have uh, our employees have been with us for a long time. Lee is our most junior employee. She's been with us six years. So we have a lot of experience. This is a typical support group, and the first one we have uh, their, their education. We bring people in to talk about uh, things like the case of my case or even help manage their disease. In this case, we have the, the wheelchair rep uh, who's from Permobile, and he's going with our wheelchair to the group and helps the officer drive. In the second picture, this is Lee who's talking with the patients. Or, uh, the, the guy in the blue shirt is very real, and he's the administrator and the, the form. So you can just see how this was, uh, I think this is a little, 2011, so about three years ago, the difference <coughs> between then and now. Our staff is very involved in ALS awareness. That says to us, because we want people to know about it, we want them to know about us and what we can do to help them, their patients, their family members. But the patients get a lot of knowledge too. They love the social aspect of uh, ALS awareness. The first picture we have uh, the ALS awareness day in red last summer to our patient uh, um, Shirley who had the ceremonial first pitch. And uh, the next picture at the top is a Jason that was an OSU and he achieved the ceremony of success at the OSU being celebrated last spring. We help the patient have awareness what it means to be able to photograph the photoprecious equipment and to the patient device here at the bottom. We're seeing a lot of patients use iPads now. That seems to be the, the first thing. Patients like to be well as long as possible. They don't talk as long as they can squeak anything out. They will use an iPad even when they can barely touch the screen anymore. It's really hard to get them into that car or wheelchair or into a, uh, a traditional communication device. And these are just a, some of the things that, of course, ALS is a mix of different things that we provide. I've got some samples up here. Um, we have the booklet, the ALS series book. We have uh, a chapter resource guide that we put together about local resources to them. We have two more books from the ALS National Association. I think you're going to love this one because I think it's very positive. That it, you know, everybody who's involved, the uh, public neurologist, somebody from the ALS Association, a couple of patients that we've been with, they're just talking about how they, you know, about their diagnosis and how they cope. I, I think it's very positive. And then we have that, I think we should mention that too, our little chapter, care services that we call it. Um, and then at the bottom is a picture of our children's packet. Uh, we send, we, we have a preschool packet, we have a, uh, a school age, and we have a teen packet. And we send them out to uh, the things that we need to help them Association is really, I mean, they have, I think they've recognized.
Paul Barr concept. Um, she started having to learn a speech, a loss of speech, and um, she was diagnosed in November of 1994. Her chemotherapy was stopped immediately because they knew what her outcome was going to be with the ELS, and she died. She was diagnosed in November of 94. Died December. was uh, three months before she passed away. She had completely lost her ability to speak. And uh, in Tennessee, where, uh, where my family was, there was no local ALS association passed the law this last year. So the thinking about living with ALS, one of the things, for example, that uh, occurred with my mom is she was still able to use her hands. So in order to communicate,
legs on that three-legged stool are advocacy and public policy and research. Um, we, our organization at the national level and at the local level is very, very involved in working on federal legislation that is connected to ALS. Uh, every year, as Brian mentioned, we go to Capitol Hill and we talk to our members of Congress and um, we go to them specific ALS priorities. And there, when we get to DC, there are probably between 700 and 900 people from across the country who are part of the ALS community. And so we're uh, talking to directors of federal programs who are updating us on how the <coughs> ALS programs are going. And then we're spending an entire day on Capitol Hill talking to our members. And two of the things that I just want to highlight just briefly is our programs which our
much research. And thank you to those from Dr. Cathcart Lab who are here involved in that ALS research. Um, it's exciting to us to be able to tell our patients that we that this is going on in, in our backyard. It gives them hope. Um, it continues that um, enthusiasm that they have left to know that there are people out there who care about this disease, who are trying to find a cure, trying to find a treatment. And uh, I will just mention, we've got some materials in the back. Please pick up whatever you would like. This is one particular piece that might be of interest to you. Um, our national organization puts it out, and it's, a, it's about research. And on the front page, to the Ice Bucket Challenge question, um, the national organization in October, I believe it was, um, noted um, the first bit of money from the Ice Bucket Challenge, it was about $22 million that they put toward uh, you know, four different programs. One of them is a neurocollaborative program, which Dr. Cathcart is a part of, and he is actually in the publication on Just inside the cover. So please take one of these. You'll see Dr. Cathcart's name. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, I think that's I think that's all. I uh, really appreciate you all coming today. Um, our cards are in the back. We um, throughout the year we hold a, a awareness event. For example, we've got one coming up in blue jackets. This is our first event. With Blue Jackets coming up on the 13th of February. Um, we did an awareness event in May last year with the OSU baseball team. We worked with the Cincinnati Reds. Um, one of our staffers was just with the Dayton Dragons yesterday. We're really starting to um, do more of these awareness types of activities, and when we do those, we, we always look for volunteers, and we look for volunteers for our walks. We 